Joel, I am assigning you as host now. Thank you. Um, Mary, it's five o'clock. Uh, we can start the public hearing if, if you would like to go ahead. And you're muted, Mary. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So welcome to the Salt Lake City Planning Division Appeals Hearing for Thursday, November 18th, 2021. My name is Mary Woodhead. I will be the hearing officer tonight. We originally had three items on the agenda. However, the third item, which was an appeal of a zoning violation at 1040 South Prospect Street has been withdrawn and we will not be hearing that matter tonight. So if you're here for that matter, um, it's no longer on the agenda. We have two other items that we will be hearing. First is an appeal of a special exception and minor alteration denial at 140 East 1st Avenue, which is the Brigham Young Cemetery. That matter um, is not a public hearing, so we will only hear from the parties on that matter. The second is a variance for a modified yard setbacks back at 320 North 800 West. That matter is a public hearing, and when we get to that, if someone is here to speak on that, we'll allow the parties to speak to the extent they need to, but public comment on that will be limited to two minutes for each comment. So if you're here for that matter, um, think a little bit about what you want to say in that time limit. Um, as to both matters, um, I'm not going to set a time limit for the presentations, but I will let everyone know that I have read the staff report, reports of both matters, and am fully familiar with um, what the parties have had to say. So keep that in mind and use your time wisely. Um, we'll start with the special exception relating to the Brigham Young Cemetery. And um, I will hear from the appellant, the um, representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints first, followed by representative of Salt Lake City, um, and then I will bring it back to the appellant um, to have the final word. So if um, the representative of the church would like to go forward, um, we're ready to hear you. Excuse me, Mary. Yes. Um, we, Amy just lost um, connectivity. She'll be back shortly. Okay. Just wanted to let you know that since she is participant in this item. Okay, so should we wait till she has connectivity? I haven't had this happen before, so I don't know um, what the process she, is. She, oh, she is, she's in the attendee list. Joel, if you'll move her from the attendee to the panelist, please. There we go. Thank you. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, and I don't know who's, who's presenting for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on this matter, but um, you can go ahead. And please identify yourself, although we have your name on the screen, it's good to have it as part of the recording as well. Thank you. My name is Emily Utt. I am the Historic Preservation Specialist for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I have been working on this cemetery um, renovation project now for, I don't know how many years. It's, we've been planning and, and preparing for this project um, for a while, doing research on the history of the cemetery, trying to understand this place. Uh, the project is underway. Uh, we have been doing a number of modifications, repairs and improvements at the site. Um, we've had some um, paving failures. The, the current fence has been in poor repair and a number of other, all those little things that have to happen when you are repairing and trying to maintain a historic space. The, um, the item that we are specifically looking um, for uh, the appeal tonight is raising the fence at the cemetery. Um, in the last several years, the number of security incidents have increased dramatically. Um, as noted in, in some of the reports that have been previously submitted, uh, we have had increased number of vandalism at the site. There has been theft. There has been defacing of historic graves. 
and other activities that are not in keeping not only with the cemetery, but with a property um, that is owned by the church that we want to kind of have a, a, a certain sense and feeling for. So we put the application in to raise the fence to really address that, that issue specifically, acknowledging that this is a historic place and that the materials and the issues that we are dealing with are not something to be taken lightly and that we are very serious about wanting to maintain the historicity of this place in not only design, but in materials. Uh, our appeal is um, based on a, on a few things. Um, one, the material integrity of the fence. This is a historic fence. Um, we fully acknowledge and support that. Uh, the fence has been modified some over the years, um, and some of those modifications have had to be done because um, when the fence was first installed, it wasn't installed to the depth that we need. Um, so the pickets already move and kind of give a little bit. Um, and so the fence to make it stable. Oh, we, um, and so the oh. argument we're making is that the, the modifications that we want to make are um, by and large reversible and will be carefully documented so that um, future um, future people working on this fence, if other solutions can be made for the security issues, we would gladly find those other solutions. Um, Nate Frost from our team is here if we need to speak a little bit more specifically about the security concerns. Nate is a representative of the church's security department. The other basis of our um, appeal is what we feel has been an uneven application of the standards for what is a minor alteration as opposed to at the same meetings that we presented, there were other applications that um, approved major modifications to historic buildings, as well as um, demolition of a contributing structure and demolition of an addition to a historic building that had also achieved some significance. Um, so we feel that a raising a fence on side yards and a backyard um, to improve security while maintaining the historicity of the front elevation of the property um, is, is generally in keeping with the standards um, set forth in the city. Um, and we, we found it difficult to, to swallow the idea that a minor modification would not be allowed while entire buildings are being demolished for the success of other projects. Um, and as we have, we tried to work with the city and come up with some ideas. Um, our first application to the city suggested that we raise the fence around the entire property. And based on feedback from staff and from the members of the Landmarks Commission, we brought in a revised proposal to raise the elevation only on the sides and the backs, incorporating a stepped setback, if you will. Um, so raising the pickets in small increments as we move forward towards the back of the property to not modify the front view and to not modify the front gates and um, kind of the more visible areas of this fence. Um, we made those modifications based on staff and um, Landmarks Commission comments. And when we brought it in the second time that uh, we were denied again, and we feel that we have, we made some, we, we listened and tried to understand the needs of the commission and we don't know how to move forward. Um, so our appeal is really based on we, the security issues, we need to raise this fence. And we as, and, and we feel that the, um, the plan we brought forward is in keeping with the standards um, and felt there was an uneven application of the standards. I think that kind so of sounds it. Was there any particular error that you thought landmarks made? I read through the minutes of the different landmarks meetings. Um, I didn't actually watch the video, but I did read the minutes that were in the staff report. And, you know, they seem to believe that the way the new fence materials would be welded together would basically destroy the, the history of the original fence. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe that 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 comment is an error. Um, ha having worked with uh, metal foundries for several years, um, even repairs to fences require new welding, new material binding with the old material. 
And a lot of the, the kind of industry standards in cast iron repair um, allow for that, those kind of repairs to be made and acknowledge that um, new, you know, cast iron should always be repaired with cast iron. So the, this idea that to weld new pieces on would destroy the, the historic material itself, um, based on my experience working with these foundries, I believe that's incorrect. Okay. Anything else you want to add about what landmarks did and any other errors that you see they made? Um, there was, we did mention in the application that we felt that there was a conflict of interest with one of the um, one of the commission members. Um, one of the members, it, two of the members had some conflict of interest. One recused himself. The other that didn't recuse himself works for an architectural firm that has a number of current projects underway with the church, um, which I think puts him and us in a hard spot. If he agrees with us and disagrees with staff, that, you know, are you privileging the client? If he disagrees with us and agrees with staff, that there could be some tension there. So we felt that there was potentially a conflict of interest there and felt that that particular commission member should have probably recused himself just to avoid even the appearance of a conflict. But there was, that wasn't raised at the hearing or- Oh, that was not raised at the hearing. Okay, okay. Anything else? Um, I think that's it for now. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, we'll hear from Salt Lake City now. Hi, um, Hannah Vickery, Senior City Attorney. Um, I think most of uh, the city's response here is captured in our briefing. If there are any specific questions, we'll um, gladly take those tonight. However, I'll just go ahead and touch on a couple things that may be worth reminding um, the hearing officer about this evening. And that is, we're here to review um, the record and the decision made by the Historic Landmark Commission um, based on the evidence that they had that night. Um, and when we hear from Ms. Utt today, I think there has been a little bit of information submitted as part of the appeal um, or presented here tonight that was not presented below. Um, so we would ask, obviously, that new evidence be excluded in the analysis about whether the Historic Landmark Commission made the correct decision um, on the night they made the decision. Um, it's interesting because the appellate um, stated a couple times tonight that um, they were sort of frustrated maybe in the process um, that they first brought a proposal, um, got some feedback and brought forth another proposal. Um, they stressed this evening that they felt that quote, um, the proposal generally kept with the standards. Um, well, if we review the city code and um, the, the commission's decision that night, we know that you have to comply with all of the standards. And the commission found that it did not comply with all the standards. So it's not one of those, unfortunately, close enough that we comply type thing and therefore should be approved. It's that we have to comply with the standards and the commission found that there wasn't compliance with all of the standards. Um, let's see. Uh, with respect to the uneven application of law, I think that's pretty well addressed in the briefing. We are just reviewing as part of this hearing, this single decision. Um, and uh, we do believe that the Historic Landmark Commission had um, substantial evidence in the record to support their decision that the standards were not met. And I think um, everyone's in agreement that the security issues are probably valid. Um, you know, these are, are really important historical, it's an important historical site. We're talking about human remains, some really sort of serious, precious history for Salt Lake City and for Utah, but the standards say, even if you do have security concerns, you need to address them in a way that's consistent with the ordinance. Is that right? 
Yes, that's the city's position, and it's uh, one of the things that you know somebody may argue that um, the policy set forth by ordinance um, preserves the historic nature of things over protecting um, the physical security of other things. But and whether that's a good or a bad policy decision isn't what we're here to talk about tonight. What we're here to talk about is whether those standards are met. And um, I guess with respect to the sort of question or the more specific error raised tonight um, being the ability to sort of undo the modification, I think that is part of the standards, but isn't all of the standards. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And I think the historic nature of the fence itself includes how it is and how it has been for a significant period of time, which includes the height itself. Um, and so I just feel that the um, decision made by the um, Historic Landmark Commission was appropriate and should be um, withheld or upheld. And then, um, with respect to the conflict of interest, that's sort of a uh, interesting concern raised in my mind late in the day. Um, we do have a process for resolving that um, sort of concern, which I think is separate from this um, process. I suppose, you know, we could argue about putting this on hold pending an outcome there, um, but as was argued in our briefing, it doesn't get the appellant the remedy she seeks, which is approval. Um, because even sort of best case scenario here, um, if we exclude the two commissioners that she alleges a conflict in, um, there's still not enough of a vote for it to pass. And if we assumed that the two commissioners weren't present, who weren't present voted um, to approve it, the the most votes she she would have had in her favor um, would have been two votes, and that's not enough um, to get her the approval she she sought. Um, and so that's sort of best case scenario. Um, so with that in mind, I think um, you know the city is comfortable um, moving forward without resolving that issue um, because. At best, it sends us back to the Historic Landmark Commission, and we don't believe it will change the outcome. Okay, thank you. Miss, I, I will give you an opportunity to respond. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that the, the main crux of, of our argument really is that for, um, our application to be denied for not following all of the standards and having other applications approved that evening that on paper also did not follow the standards, but the commit but the staff was somehow able to to I don't I don't know what the right word is to um, demonstrate that they could, you know that is. In, in my experience with landmarks commissions and as a as a preservationist myself, the bar I find is generally very high to approve a demolition. And to as as the commissioner said in the meeting that evening, well, we need to approve this for the good of the overall project. Um, and there are other you know properties in, in Salt Lake City that are probably should be demolished that are you know not because of that high bar. And so to find a minor modification not approved, um, even though acknowledging that allowing the modification would be for the good of the project, um, I found I found that standard kind of hard to to understand um, that kind of that, you know, how you can take one set of standards and apply them so differently across the board. Um, Although it does seem to some extent what you're saying is that landmarks made an error in approving the demolition mm -hmm. and so because they made that error there should you know it should just be repeated presuming that no. you know the it's, leeway it's not, is, it's not, is it's, not it's consistent not, with the rules yeah yeah 
I could, yeah, um, I, 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 I understand and I, I think I concede the city's point that going, you know, the conflict of interest probably wouldn't, it wouldn't change the final vote. Um, it would, it was interesting that evening, you know, as the discussions going are, are going back and forth and hearing all of those as, as people are, are talking, it, you know, I don't know if that would have changed the vote either to have those two um, commissioners not present in that meeting. Um, but I can see that point that the city, you know, that taking, um, if that commissioner had not voted, it would not have changed the final decision. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Um, our security officer, Nate, um, emailed me asking, if, saying if he had a comment he wanted to make, would it be appropriate to allow him to speak? Um, so the record in this is the record that was before landmarks. Okay. So if what he's going to say is something that would be new evidence in the record, I don't know that it would be appropriate or helpful or consistent with the rules. I will say, I don't think Salt Lake City, or at least my understanding from the record, that there's any dispute that there are security concerns. So I don't think that's an issue. Okay. 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 But I don't know, Nate, if we need you to say anything. Thank you for coming, though. <laughs> anything else you'd like to add? Um, I, th I think it's kind of been covered and discussed, so. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to close this matter and take it under advisement, and I will issue a written decision, hopefully fairly quickly after Thanksgiving, maybe before. Thank every thank you for your time and thank you for coming. Okay, we will move on to our next matter, which is um, variance for a modified side yard yard setbacks at 320 North 8th West. Um, do we need to take a break? Are we ready to go? Um, so I would like to hear first from the petitioner, Trevor or his rep, if you'd like to go forward. Um, I will repeat what I said before. This matter um, is open to public comment. So what I will do is I'll hear from the petitioner. And as I said earlier, I've read the staff report, so I've gone through all those materials. So I think I understand what's in front of me. So we'll hear from the petitioner. We'll have any additional information provided by Salt Lake City staff, and then we'll open the matter for public comment and public comment will be limited to two minutes per person. And if there is public comment, we'll bring it back to the petitioner and give you a chance to respond to anything people say. So hopefully that works for everyone. And so I would like to hear from Mr. Stevens or his representative. Thank you, Mary. Um, my name is Trevor. I'll be uh, discussing a few of the points here regarding this uh, request for variance uh, side yard setback modification. Um, just according to the uh, to the staff notes, um, it looks to be that there were just a few uh, requests specifically related to uh, myself providing uh, to this committee or, or in this sit setting. Uh, some evidence that the subject parcel has rights to use the existing alleyway to the south of the parcel uh, to access the garage located to the rear of the dwelling. Um, we had run a title report uh, quite a while ago, and um, there is a warranty deed that was recorded uh, June 7, 1905, defining uh, the right of way. It is a 10 foot right of way, um, which does allow access to the property. Um, and that's, of course, uh, with the county recorder's office. So I think that that should answer the question. Um, okay. And can you submit that documentation to the city? Yes, would you like to? So I've, I've got, um, I can submit uh, our title report and they, I can also submit a copy of the warranty deed. Would you like both? Yes. Okay, yes. I can do yes. that. The warranty deed is a little hard to, to read, um, but if, if, there needs, you know, if, if there needs to be clarification, I'm happy to provide that, and um, and or try to, you know, provide a better copy from the recorder's office. But that, unfortunately, it's an old document; it's over 100 years old, and that's the best I think the city has on file. And um, 
anyway, that's what I'm stuck with. That's fine. Okay. So do you want to tell me a little bit about the project? And why you uh, need sure. the um, and, and I know you read the staff report. Um, basically, to, just to give you some personal background into it, um, my dad had actually bought the property from uh, someone that he knew. She was in kind of a difficult situation, uh, and I understand why. The house was pretty much in disrepair. Um, so, in good faith, I think he he helped this lady out to try to, you know do what's good, if you will, for the community. It's just the way my dad operates. Unfortunately, my dad gets in over his head. Uh, 13 years later, I'm, I'm able to purchase it from him as he had basically done nothing with the property. Uh, you know, we've had significant, um, numerous, I mean, I, I, I can't even count how many criminal activities have gone on in the home. Um, we've had attempts to remodel the home and things were stolen out of the property. We've had multiple sets of windows damaged and replaced and, and broken again. Um, so unfortunately it, it is an eyesore. Um, it is a magnet for crime, and I think for us, that's that's the the number one reason we would like to to you know accelerate the the building permit, or the, I should say that the variance process, then the building permit process, then the demolition process, um, and as a segue from from basically the criminal activity into the demolition and rebuilding, um, we have looked in, which I believe my father had an inline addition that was approved. Um, but really going into it, we had multiple general contractors out there looking at the stone foundation and specifically with the recent earthquake, uh, you know, a lot of people just did not feel comfortable building on top of that. And the, the cost of having to modify the existing structure was just significantly more expensive than, than we had researched to just tear the structure down and start over from scratch, which is, doesn't make sense. Um, but having go, going through a remodel myself in Bountiful, um, I can understand where, you know, three or four times the labor aspect comes into play when we try to kind of keep an existing structure there and, and build with what we've got with, with old technology and mending new technology and, and uh, you know, new standards of building and building codes and so forth. So what, what we had ultimately decided is, is what I felt should have happened all along is to request a variance, um, explain the reasonings why. Obviously, we, we know the non-conforming lot is, um, you know, provides a significant hardship in terms of building a structure that's literally makes any sense at all um, in terms of even moving about the interior of the structure functionally. Um, it's just an odd lot. Uh, we've approached all the, looked at the drawings. It looks. Yeah, it's yeah. tough as is. And I know there are some other variances uh, that we included. Um, that were that were granted by the city that unfortunately had some quirky aspects from an aesthetic and architectural perspective, but ultimately was able to meet both the criteria of the city and the criteria of the variance and allow the homeowner and the builder um, to, or the landowner, I should say, to, to move forward with something functional. Um, I, I think for the most part, it's it's fairly simple. We're not building something extravagant or out of the ordinary. I think it will fit with the area. Um, I think, you know, Salt Lake City is certainly in need of, of housing and, and this will certainly be um, one additional home of the many thousands that we need that ultimately has not been available in the last 14 or 15 years, which will now be available ultimately helping the community. So we feel that okay. hopefully the city feels the same way. Okay, thank you. Um, is there someone from Salt Lake City who'd like to speak to this? Yes, um, my name is Brooke Olson, so I'll be presenting for the city and um, the applicant did go over some of the existing conditions of the property. So um, I'll just touch on um, exactly what's being requested and just some of the key issues that we looked at. Um, so the, um, the project request is for approval of um, a variance to construct a new dwelling. Um, the project is located in the R15000 zoning district, um, and the new dwelling would encroach approximately one foot into the northern side yard setback and seven feet into the southern side yard setback. So, um, as the applicant stated, um, there is an existing structure on the property, which has been vacant for 13 years. And as discussed in the staff report, um, the R15000 zoning district requires a minimum lot width of 50 feet 
and minimum side road setbacks of 10 feet on one side and four feet on the other. Um, the subject lot has a width of 25 feet and the existing structure has side yard setbacks of four feet on the northern side and one foot six inches on the southern side respectively. Um, so the Salt Lake City um, and county records indicate the parcel was created in 1934 and is considered to be legally non-complying. Um, and say the um, existing structure is also considered to be a non-compliant structure. Um, so the width of the lot um, presents a hardship when applying the required side yard setback dimensions as they limit um, the potential exterior width of the building to 11 feet, resulting in a very narrow structure that is um, pretty limited in func functionality. Um, so since um, the residents began developing this area prior to the adoption of the current zoning ordinance, various nearby properties um, do not meet the minimum lot width of 50 feet. Um, however, as you can see, or as you have seen in attachment A um, in the staff report, the 25 foot lot width of the subject parcel um, is the second narrowest in the, the immediate area, and um, that is with the exception of one other lot in the block that is 23 feet in width um, and seems to have a similar development history. The majority of the nearby um, substandard lots are at least 30 feet wide. Um, the variance request is to allow the applicant um, to construct a new home on the lot that maintains similar non-compliant side yard setback dimensions of the existing structure, but meets all other requirements of the zoning ordinance. Yeah, it looked like from the staff report that it was compliant with the rest of the, the rest of the rules. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, and the main purpose of the side yard setbacks is to provide op um, an open space buffer between structures and the streets on which they're located, um, sufficient space will be provided between the proposed dwelling and the neighboring structures. Um, as the closest structure to the south will be approximately 45 feet from the proposed dwelling and the closest structure to the north will be approximately 20 feet away. In addition, there's the private alley, um, which is 10 feet in width, located along the southern property boundary. Um, which does provide some additional space and buffering um, between the subject parcel and the neighboring properties to the south. So staff is, is of the opinion that the request for reduced side yard setbacks is appropriate and the case meets all standards for granting a variance as discussed in the staff report. So staff is recommending approval of the variance um, with that condition listed in the staff report. Um, that it sounds like the applicant has um, some evidence to submit for. Um, so that concludes my comments and I'm happy to take any questions. No questions, but thank you. Thanks, Brooke. Mr. Stevens, anything else you'd like to add? No, um, I mean, I appreciate you guys even going into this. We've tried to for a few years actually to sell the property, I think. A lot of people knew what was entailed with trying to even get a variance going to even make something of this. We tried to sell it as is. And um, unfortunately the home was purchased during the height of the market previously. And uh, up until recently, even even in a distressed situation, the, the, the property itself is just really, um, it's junk. <laughs> I don't know what to, how a better way to say it, but it, it's definitely in need of, of uh, renovation and, and we're excited to finally do something um, with it. And, and hopefully within a, a variance approval, we can fast track that and, and, you know, try to get on that process. Okay. I'm going to open the public hearing. Um, is there anyone who would, wishes to speak to this? Do we have anyone? Uh Ms. Woodhead is Joel Patterson. We have two attendees, um, so I, I'll okay. unmute them and uh, one at a time to see if they have comments to provide. Uh, Cindy Cromer, do you have comments you'd like to provide? No, I'm just um, I'm just hanging on after the previous hearing. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Tony Simerod. Uh, do you have comments you'd like to provide? Yes, I'm just listening in. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's it, uh, Ms. Rodette, nobody else is in attendance. Okay, do we have anything else we need to hear from the parties? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, I am inclined to grant this variance, but I'm not going to um, completely commit until I see the documents that the applicant is provide is going to provide. Um, and once I have those, I'll issue a written decision, hopefully in about the next week, memorializing what we've discussed here. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate your time. I think that closes our hearing agenda for tonight. Anything else, Joel? Uh, no, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aubrey, thanks so much. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Good to see you.